because we can harp on him all day. However, that's not going to change anything. It's not going to change anything at all. Here's why. Because we will meet him with criticism. We will meet him with contempt. We will meet him with defensiveness. And that, my friend, is not the key to keeping your relationship or inspiring change. Hey, girl, imagine a life where you feel supported, connected, and understood. I get it. Being a mom is hard, especially when you're spinning so many plates. We exhaust ourselves trying to create the perfect life for our family. You deserve to enjoy your family without the stress perfectionism brings. On this podcast, I provide practical and relatable life experiences. I teach women quick and easy to use strategies to help them reclaim their identity, reignite their marriage, and enjoy their children. If you're ready to be challenged, then pull up a chair, grab a pen and paper, because it's about to go down. I'm Veronica Cisneros, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and this is the Empowered and Unapologetic Podcast. Working through resentment, regaining values after constant arguing. So first, let's go ahead and look at what resentment even means. Resentment. Google says it's bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. So what does that necessarily mean? And so it resentment describes this like negative emotional reaction to being mistreated. And what I find when working with couples is resentment starts to build once we start to feel like we're just constantly treated unfairly. Like, let's just look, it goes with the definition. We feel like we've been treated unfairly. We feel like we're the ones that do everything in the household. We're the ones who feel completely unappreciated. We bend over backwards. We do all of the things to make the relationship work. And we get frustrated and we get frustrated because it feels like we're the only ones carrying the weight. So how many of you on here feel like, you know what? I'm totally that person. I'm the one who carries the weight. I'm the one who does it all. My partner really doesn't care. You know, he goes to work, he comes back, and that's as far as it goes. But for the most part, he has no clue who our teacher, who our kids' teachers are. He has no clue when the kids need to be fed. He has no clue what the kids' um, sleep schedule looks like. Like, I'm literally doing it on my own. And if something was to happen to me, God forbid something was to happen to me, he would be in trouble. Like, he would be in total total trouble because I do it all. Like, it kind of goes back to, I've watched some of those TikToks. Have any of you guys watched those TikToks where it's like, <laughs> it's like, um, you know, somebody speaking to their wife um, while you, at, at her funeral, like at her reception. And he's like, you know, hey. So I need to ask you a question. Where is, and I'm not, I'm not repeating it verbatim, but just like maybe some things my husband might ask me. And, you know, he leans in to her while she's like literally laying in the coffin. Have you guys watched that TikTok, those TikToks? And he's like, hey, so quick question. Where is, and then he, you know, fill in the blank. Where's this? Where's this? Where do I find this? How do I do this? Okay, so our daughter's having this problem. What do I say to her? I remember there was a point where my husband, um, when he and I were in this period of resentment, I think one thing he would have asked me is, hey, Pharrell, wake up. So I need you to help me find this post-it note. But it's not like the average post-it notes because I ended up having to tear it up. There was other things written on it. But I I ended up writing something really, really important on the corner of the post-it note. And I think it was yellow. Maybe it was pink. I don't know. But I think I put it like, I think I put it in my room or in our room. But then maybe I put it in the kitchen. But like it was pink and I wrote something really, really important on it. And I think I even told you about it. Remember? Yeah. My husband would totally, would have totally like try to wake me up from the dead to find this little ass post-it note that's like a corner piece with some like really vital information and he couldn't find it. And so this is where it goes with starting to keep score. A good amount of us start to realize, wait a minute, 
what the hell am I doing? If I'm doing it all and I'm doing it all by myself, then he obviously doesn't care. And we're constantly arguing over and over about these things and nothing changes. So I feel like if nothing's going to change, why do I even put up with this? Anybody ever feel that way where they get to this point that it's like, why, why am I even here? Why am I in this place where I'm, I'm doing it all. I'm all by myself, no care in the world. And I don't even know how to recover from this because we're constantly arguing. It got to a point where I don't even tell him anything because why am I going to tell him anything? It's only going to turn into an argument and we're not connecting. We don't know how to communicate with each other. There's like no boundaries in our marriage. And it's gotten to a point where I don't feel desired by him anymore. And the flirting is no longer existent. I feel like I've lost my friend. And I don't necessarily know exactly when I lost him. But yeah, it feels like, it feels like I, lost, I lost my friend. The empty promises just aggravate me so much. He says he will do something or take care of something, then he doesn't. The passion is so low these days that I feel parenthood and other commitments are taking control. I want to feel like it's me he wants to spend time with. I want him to at least acknowledge me when I come to a, when I come into a room. I damn near do everything. I just wish I felt supported. Anybody here feel that way? Where it's like, I want to go ahead and definitely connect and I don't know how. And so again, this resentment is building. I'm starting to feel flooded. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. I want to go ahead and regain those values after constantly arguing, but I just don't know how. Well, ladies, I'm here to tell you, yes, you can definitely work through resentment in your marriage. It's something you can absolutely, with a sh- without a shadow of a doubt, do. But I want you to think about, okay, if I feel like I lost my best friend, when, did, when exactly did I lose him? When did we stop being the best of friends? Was it before kids? Like, or, or I'm sorry, was it after we had kids? Was it after he took that job? Was it after I took the job? Was it after I started to excel in my career? Was it after he started to excel in his career? So what I want you to do is I want you to grab a pen and paper and I want you to write that down. I want you to write down, when did I lose my best friend? And I want you to think of memories, like of when when you guys were the best of friends. And I want you to start to write that down. And then I want you to think, fast forward a little bit. When did I start to lose him? And then now where I want you to go is I want you to think about Maybe when you stopped being his best friend. And so when we think about best friends, we think about like the relationship we have with them. We think about, you know, you know, let's say if your best friend, your absolute best friend was to come up to you and say, hey, you know, I have this crazy business idea. You know, I decided I was going to go ahead and um, this is actually a pretty good idea, but let's just, just run with me for a minute. You know, I decided, you know, we go to the river every single weekend and everybody's like, damn, tacos sound really bomb, but ain't nobody going to jump into the boat and, you know, go to get tacos. Like, it's just not going to happen. We're in the middle of nowhere. However, if there was like a taco boat that came running through, like, oh, it would be on like Donkey Kong. So I'm always saying that. So I thought, you know what? What the hell? I'm going to be the taco boat, not a taco truck. I'm going to be the taco boat. Like right away, we'd look at her and be like, hell yeah, we would encourage her. We would go ahead and say, yeah, let's go ahead and think of business ideas. And you guys would go back and forth. Business ideas, what are we going to call it, right? But you would be all in. You would be 100% all in. How can I best support you? You know what? I've been thinking about ideas on my own. And I thought, you know what? It'd probably be easier for you to do like, you know, when people are out on the river, it gets really hot. So why not do fish tacos? But there would be that level of engagement. There would be that huge level of support. That's what I'm talking about with regards to friendship. Because at one point in our relationship, 
We lost that. At one point in our relationship, we stopped supporting one another. And instead, we allowed that resentment to kind of seep through and take over that frustration because we started to keep score. We started to keep score on all the things we were doing and all the things he wasn't doing. And then you slowly got to a point where it was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not giving you anything anymore. I'm just not doing it. Or you're starting to be at this place where you're starting to pull back and you're noticing it and it's scaring you. Anybody start to notice like, ah, the things that I would do, I would wake up early in the morning and I would make sure he had his coffee. I would wake up early in the morning and I would make sure he had his breakfast or when he would come home, I would greet him at the door with a kiss. Now I don't even do that. There's this transition that happens in relationships and most of us are not in tune with what that transition even looks like. So this is why I'm asking you guys to write it down right now. Because I want you to be able to identify when you felt like you lost your best friend and when you felt like you stopped showing up as your partner's best friend. For a long time, for a long time, I thought the key to a marriage, the key to a strong, strong relationship, a strong, healthy relationship is communication. Hell, to be honest with you, That's what I taught initially when I was, when I became a therapist, especially when I started, um, when I started working with couples, I was so laser focused on I statements. I was so, so laser focused on reflective statements, right? I was so, so focused on, okay, or reflective listening. I was so laser focused on that. Okay. What did you hear? Okay. Go ahead and repeat that. Ask clarifying questions. Use I statements. But what I realized is people are still having problems. And although now they were able to utilize I statements, they were able to go ahead and go back and reflect, ask for clarity, that bitter indignation was still there. That resentment was still there. And it was blinding them from seeing their partner for who he really is and who he isn't. We were so caught up in the beginning by the potential of who our partner could be. And that's initially what ended us up attracting us to him, right? I call it Cinderella, Cinderella syndrome because it is. You can call it, we could call it Cinderella syndrome or Prince Charming syndrome. But we were so keyed up. Anybody here like so keyed up on the potential, on who he can be, on who he could be if he just stopped with his addiction, on who he could be if he just saw like that we're actually a good family and he's actually happy. If he could go past you know, whatever his mom tells him, if he could go past whatever his friends tell him and he can make decisions on his own, we would be perfect family. We'd be so happy together. I see his potential. How many of you here have said that? I see his potential. I see who he can be. Well, that's what trips us up from seeing who he actually is because he tells us every single day, but we don't believe him. And so we try to change him into who we think and believe he could be, how he can be better. And then we do more. We compromise ourselves over and over again to please and appease and meet the needs of the family and resent him the entire time, not even knowing it. And so we're here at this place where we're starting to realize, wait a minute, our values are no longer lining up. That resentment is running the relationship. If we only focused, especially as therapists, especially as professionals who are working with couples, if we laser focus on communication, we have now put our clients first in line for divorce. Dr. Gottman, who is like the guru of couples therapy, who is the guru of couples research, he did this love, um, he did, he had conducted this research study, right? And in his research, he found that the number one key 
to relationships is friendship. How do you come back from arguments? Do you go with a, do you initiate a conversation with a harsh startup? Do you initiate a conversation with like your emotions, their complete frustrations? Or are you able to communicate effectively? Are you able to realize that the partner, the person that you're talking to is actually somebody you love? How many of you here, like the minute you're frustrated and overwhelmed and you go to approach your partner, how many of you forget like this is the person I love and you're now at the point where it's like, dude, the only person I see right in front of me is the person that just frustrates the hell out of me because he won't do the damn dishes when he said he'll do them. The person in front of me frustrates me because he won't spend freaking time with his kids. The person in front of me tells me he loves me, but I have yet to see any form of affection. I can't even tell you the last time he told me I was sexy. But he'll for damn sure ask for sex tonight. We've lost that friendship. And so for me, after working with several couples, after working with men and women solely alone, what I found was the real key, the true key to building a healthy foundation, to regaining values after constant arguing, is vulnerability. Both parties being open to vulnerability. Both parties being willing to go ahead and trust their partner Wait a minute, Veronica, trust? I can't trust my partner. My partner hurts me all the time. Well, how does he hurt you? Well, he comes home, does nothing, sits down, and watches TV. And then he'll eat. And then maybe engage with me a little bit, ask me how my day's gone. But if I say something, then it turns into an argument. And although we might know that there is love there, we don't flirt as much as we used to. We both are invested in the relationship, but we both, we both do like avoid uncomfortable conversations and we avoid them just because we both don't want to argue. We're so tired of arguing, the constant arguing. So ladies, I ask you, when did you lose your best friend and when did you stop becoming his best friend? Because I want you to see the issues that you're bringing into the relationship. I already know that he's bringing in a whole list, probably freaking a huge list of um, issues. I recognize that. And I'm still going to take it even further because we can harp on him all day. However, that's not going to change anything. It's not going to change anything at all. Here's why. Because we will meet him with criticism. We will meet him with contempt. We will meet him with defensiveness. And that, my friend, is not the key to keeping your relationship or inspiring change. But if we could start to acknowledge, how have I stopped being his friend? What have I stopped doing? What did I love to do that maybe I don't like to do anymore? Do I acknowledge the things that he does for our family? Do I acknowledge the way he loves me? Do I even allow him to love me? Do I support him as a father? Well, of course I support him as a father, Veronica. Why wouldn't I support him as a father? Well, let me go ahead and give you an example. How many times do you tell him he's doing it wrong? How many times when he tells you he's going to wash the dishes, do you complain about the dishes being washed incorrectly or the dishwasher being loaded incorrectly or the diaper not being put on right? Or if he was to take the kids to the park, how often do you lecture him about what he needs and what he doesn't need and how stupid of him to go to a park without any damn diapers? The passion is so low these days that I feel parenthood and other commitments are taking control. I want to feel like it's me he wants to spend time with. Yeah, I've said those exact words a hundred times to my friends after realizing that the man I said I do to wasn't the same person. Or was I just imagining it? But here's what I finally realized that changed things for me almost overnight. I started to use four simple and effective steps that changed our communication and connection for the better. 
As a licensed marriage and family therapist, I got excited and started showing my clients. And they too were seeing changes instantly. Whether you've been married for one year or 15, these tips work and I can't wait to share them with you. Girl, I got you. I want to personally invite you to my live two-hour online workshop. This is for moms who have said, the empty promises just aggravate me so much. He says he will do something or take care of something. Then he doesn't. Communication has always been a weak point for us. He says things without thinking. I try to logically work through things and he reacts emotionally. I try to say what I feel in a constructive manner. He takes it personally and attacks me. Boundaries are a confusing topic for me because I am a helper. I have this innate need to help anyone I can. So if this is you and you are ready to get off this hamster wheel, then allow me to guide you through this four-step process. I can't wait to meet you personally. So again, this is a two-hour live workshop. And for whatever reason, if you cannot attend, girl, I got you. This will be recorded, which means you will have lifetime access. This is for women only. If you are ready to go from roommates to lovers, then let's go ahead and step outside of our comfort zones together. Allow me to guide you. If you're ready, what I'd like you to do is go to empoweredandunapologetic.com forward slash workshop. Again, that is empoweredandunapologetic.com forward slash workshop. Get ready, mama, because we are about to do some work. I've had men in my office, and I've said this in previous episodes, but I've had men in my office, and the first thing they'll tell me is, I feel like I have to be invited to participate with my family. Because it feels like no matter what I do, I'm being reprimanded, criticized. No matter what I do, it feels like I'm going to be corrected. So shit, I might as well not do anything at all. Because if I don't do anything at all, well, for one, I avoid I avoid her. I avoid her telling me how much better she is than I am. And then in addition to that, I also didn't have to do whatever the hell she asked me to do. Either way, I'm going to get yelled at. Either way, I'm going to be ridiculed. Either way, I'm going to get scolded. So this, this path is less of the work. But what men don't realize is it feels like they're checking out. When they avoid, it definitely feels like they're checking out. It feels like we don't matter. It feels like the family doesn't matter. And when we feel like we don't matter, when we feel like the the family doesn't matter, we definitely start to feel alone. But this is all due to lack of vulnerability. And so I want you to think about how are you showing up as a friend? Well, Veronica, I can't trust him. I can't trust him with my emotions because if I open up and if I'm vulnerable, then that gives him full ride to go out and hurt me. No, it doesn't. So what you're basically telling me is, I don't know how to deal with my own emotions. I don't know how to deal with discomfort. So instead, I'll pull away. I'll pull away altogether. Because if I pull away, then I won't get hurt. Okay, yeah, I I see how that might work. But if you're both pulling away, aren't we technically disconnecting? Are we, is, is this the relationship you want? Is this what you signed up for? Well, no. Okay, so then what are we doing? What are we doing? And if I have to be completely honest with you, and I am, you're playing a game. You're playing a game of Russian roulette with your marriage. And I'm going to tell you right now, you will lose that game. You will both lose that game. A relationship usually starts on that path of divorce when resentment is huge in the relationship, when the values are no longer there, where you guys are no longer working towards those values. So if you can acknowledge that you have a place in this, you're not 100% to blame, but you do have a place in this then there's something you can do different. Most divorced couples will say, um, will say that, you know, they missed all of the signs that they allowed that anger, those feelings of frustration, 
that pain to go ahead and deter them from truly working on their marriage. And when they did work on their marriage, it was still based off of frustration and looking for red flags versus taking a pause, being open, being understanding, and being vulnerable, being open with trusting the process. The reason why most couples divorce, and they don't really realize this until after, is because they both stopped to realize the value of the relationship. Write that down. They both stopped. They both stopped to realize the value of the relationship. They both denied it. And so if you find yourself on this path where you guys are not necessarily working toward each other, you guys are easy and quick to attack. You're easy to, and quick to position your partner as the enemy. Well, then we have to do something different. So let me go ahead and give you a couple signs of resentment. <clears throat> the way you know there are there's resentment in your relationship is that number one thing that I just gave you. You start to keep score. There's this avoidance, right? There's fear or avoidance that's in your relationship. And that avoidance is avoidance to go ahead and have a conversation with your partner. That avoidance is being open, vulnerable. That avoidance is being intimate. That avoidance is something along the lines of cuddling up with each other. Like you feel it, you know it's there, but you don't want to. That avoidance is also with, and I'm, I've been guilty of this myself. How many of you have been guilty of this? After an argument, when we see our partner trying to go ahead and come back from it and problem solve, we're so set in our ways that we want him maybe not to grovel, but we want him to really feel the magnitude of how much pain we feel. And so we avoid that little tiny voice inside of us that's saying, hug him, kiss him, forgive him, accept his apology. And so instead, we harp on it or we bring it up later. How many of you here have been guilty of that? Where you hold on to that pain, denying your partner forgiveness, denying your partner the ability to go ahead and move on. Again, this is not, I'm not, I'm not solely, I want to make sure I'm clear. I'm not solely pos- positioning you as the bad guy. I'm not. He's not here, so I can't work on him. You are. So because you are, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go ahead and be direct and, 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 and highlight the th- issues that you are bringing into the relationship. Because as you start to change, the relationship changes. It's this beautiful thing that happens. I've worked with several women, just women. And after our work together, holy moly, the relationship is completely different because they were able to inspire change. And their partner also started to do their own personal work on their own. It wasn't forced. They did it on their own. And so ladies, I'm here to tell you, I I do this for a living. I'm here to tell you, work on yourself, regardless if you stay with him, regardless if you leave him, regardless wherever this goes, work on yourself and you will see the relationship change. That avoidance, I want you to be mindful of. If you're guilty of it, write it down. If you allow fear to go ahead and determine whether or not you're going to connect with your partner and you even avoid physical any form, any form of physical contact, any form of intimacy, if you purposely use sex as a weapon, own it, own it. This is how I'm not showing up as my partner's best friend because I'm playing a game. Like I said, I was guilty of this too. So make sure you write it down. Other signs that resentment is in your relationship are those feelings of regret like complete regret. You know, when you go into, you know, I regret doing these things for you. 
I totally regret loving you. I totally regret the day I met you. I totally regret the fact that I gave you some last night because you're acting this way today. How many of you guys have said that? I totally regret having sex with you last night. I totally regret having having done that because now look at you, right? I, I'm going to be honest. I've said that before too. That regret though, again, think about it. You're positioning yourself as higher than them. In addition to that, you are playing a game. Sex is not a game. I'm going to tell you right now, your partner measures the stability of your guys' relationship through how intimate you guys are together. I've heard that from several men. About 95% of the men that I've worked with have all literally said that. I gauge where we're at in our relationship. And women are under the impression that they just want sex, which is true. You're not wrong. But it's it's not for the reasons that you think of. It's not for the reasons that you withhold it. Men go ahead and gauge how well the relationship is going by how often you guys are intimate with one another. How physically attracted you are to them. They don't know. They don't do well with communication. They don't do well with processing emotions because they don't know how to. It is not our job to teach them. They will go ahead and learn. We will go ahead and guide them through it. But I want you to just pay attention to what's happening. All right. And how you might be using regret in your relationship. Another thing, and it kind of goes back to that avoidance or even that fear I want you to think about how often you bring up the past, how often you bring up the past. That right there, my friend, is definitely resentment. Your unhealed wounds, you are using as armor. You're using that as armor to protect yourself and hurt your partner. So it serves two ways. It has, it's as a weapon. Well, you did this. Or remember when this happened, it is a weapon. And because this happened, because of me being treated unfairly, because of this situation or last year's situation or five years ago situation, I can't trust you. Armor. Pay attention to that. How often am I weaponizing the past and then using it in my self-defense? Because again, you are playing a you are playing a game. You are definitely playing a game. And like I said earlier, it is a game that you will not win. I want you to also think about those negative feelings that you have about your partner. You know, that frustration and how you might turn it into, you know, feelings of just frustration, positioning him as an enemy right? Not necessarily effectively communicating because again, you're avoiding, not necessarily setting and respecting boundaries because we don't know how. Who here knows how to set a boundary? Who here even knows what a boundary is? Let me ask a better question. Who here doesn't know how to set and respect a boundary? I know I didn't. I had no clue what the hell boundary was at all. I didn't, I had no clue how to set and respect them because nobody had taught me in my household. We weren't allowed to set boundaries. Kids were not allowed to set boundaries. And I know I'm not alone in this, but we were not allowed to set boundaries. And it was more of, you know, kids were to be seen, not heard. And so those are all things that are interfering with your ability to regain those values especially after you guys have constantly argued. So now resentment has showed and reared its ugly head, and now it's in between your relationship. It is not your partner that is the enemy. It's the issue that is in between your guys' relationship that you guys are both guilty for, both of you. If he was here, I'd be saying the same exact thing to him. So ladies, in order for you to regain those values, After constantly arguing, I want you to pay attention to what issues you're bringing into the marriage and how are you no longer showing up as a best friend? Because I'm going to tell you right now, the way you're feeling, if he was sitting right next to us, he would probably say he's feeling the same way. 
I can't tell you how many men have said it. And I've purposely asked the men first, just so the women could hear it. And each one of them, every single time, every single time when I'm doing couples work, every single time the woman would look over and be like, what? I never knew. I never knew you. I never knew you felt that way. I never knew you had those feelings. I never knew that that's how you, how you positioned me, that you thought that I didn't love you, that you were afraid to lose me. I never thought you really cared. And it's doing work with women. It's doing work with couples that they're able to see both sides. Many women lose their own identity in the shadow of being a mom and a wife. We are a community of women who support each other. We leave perfectionism behind to become empowered and unapologetic. I want to personally invite you to join our girl gang. It's a free Facebook community for women just like you. Go to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash empowered and unapologetic. See you there. What's up, ladies? Just want to let you guys know that your ratings and reviews for this podcast are greatly appreciated. If you love this podcast, please go to iTunes right now, write a review, rate the episode, and subscribe. Don't forget to share it with your friends. I know. I know we've been taught that motherhood requires alcohol. I know we've been taught not to question our relationship with alcohol until we've lost everything. And I know we've been taught that if we do dare to examine our relationship with alcohol, we need to head straight to AA and declare ourselves an alcoholic who is powerless to alcohol forever. But what if all that isn't true? That's definitely not my story. I'm Suzanne, the host of the Sober Mom Life podcast. I'm an influencer who stopped drinking in January 2020, and since then, I've been telling the truth about motherhood, influencing, alcohol, and sobriety. If you suspect deep down that glass or three of wine at night might just be making motherhood harder, well, you're right. Come and join me as I chat with other sober and sober curious moms. Let's laugh, cry, and normalize sobriety together, all while we reheat our coffee for the fourth time today. Addiction impacts all of us. Addiction's consequences run through all of us. From ourselves to our loved ones and through our communities, addiction creates so much loss and grief. My name is Dwayne Osterlin, and I'm the host of the Addicted Mind podcast, a show featuring personal stories, expert guests, and vital information about addiction and addiction recovery. We'll talk with leading treatment providers to discuss the latest research and treatment options for this devastating disease and advocate for mental health awareness. We discuss topics like the importance of creating a community of support to helping loved ones to some of the latest research on psychedelic medicines. The Addicted Mind podcast has been about creating hope, listening to stories of many amazing people that have overcome addiction and are thriving. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, subscribe to the Addicted Mind podcast wherever you get your podcasts or check out theaddictedmind.com. New episodes every Monday. See you there. I'm Madeline, and I'm the host of the Happiest Sober Podcast. I got sober in my 20s after a decade of gray area drinking, and the greatest plot twist of all time was realizing that alcohol, the thing that I thought made my life the most happy and fun and exciting, was actually the exact thing preventing me from living my happiest and best life. My mom is 40 years sober, and she joins me on my podcast very often. I like to call her my part-time co-host, and I also bring you solo episodes where I share my top tips, tricks, and mindset shifts in sobriety, and lots of how-tos for navigating all the things sober, from weddings to parties to holidays to bachelorette parties to trips. I'm also joined by so many guests who come on and share their sober stories, and they're all so, so inspiring. I'm here to show you that life doesn't end when you quit drinking. In fact, it's very much the opposite. And no matter what your relationship was with alcohol, life can be the absolute happiest when you're sober. New episodes come out every Tuesday. You can listen to Happiest Sober Podcast wherever you get your podcasts.